Okay, I think, uh, Joan, if you agree, we can start with the session. Thank you for putting up the slides. Again, uh, a warm welcome to everybody who's joining on today's session on advancing nurturing care as a protective factor for young children affected by crisis. My name is Maria Benavides. I am the Early Childhood Development Coordinator at the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, or INE. I'm here on behalf of the Early Childhood Development Working Group, which supported this session's planning and organizing. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful moderator for this session, Joan Lombardi, Director of Early Opportunity. Joan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria. And again, sorry, we'll come back to the video. I, greetings to all who joined us today. I'm delighted to be moderating this very important session on advancing nurturing care as a protective factor for young children affected by crisis. I want to thank the Alliance for including this session, for recognizing the importance of young children and supporting young children and their families all the time, but particularly in emergencies. We have five terrific speakers, which I'll introduce um, one by one before they speak, and I'll give you ample time for questions. I'll have uh, introduce um, three speakers, then we'll have a Q&A, and then two more speakers and we'll have a Q&A. But before we get started, um, we wanted to start by hearing from you. Uh, if you could put the Mentimeter question up, um, we want you to use the link and tell us what you hope and expect to get out of this session. And if there are any specific questions you would like us to resolve for you, many of you are working in emergency context, please include them in the Mentimeter, uh, answers to the questions. So if you would use that link and then we'll share the results. Um, while you're doing that, I just want to say, particularly since we didn't show the video, um, I want to say some framing for this session. Um, again, it's on nurturing care. One of the central goals of child protection is, as we all know, increasing the protective factors for children, um, particularly in emergencies, and reducing the risk factors. This is, in fact, the heart of what we mean by prevention an area that has long been ignored, which is particularly important for young children. The nurturing care framework is central to the early years, and there are five elements to the nurturing care framework, health, nutrition, responsive caregiving, safety and security, and early learning. All five of these are important. Assuring safety and security, of course, is most important when we are thinking about young children in crisis. But all too often, people think that safety and security is the only element of nurturing care that's part of child protection for young children. But indeed, we all believe, and I'm sure you do too, that all five elements of the nurturing care framework are protective factors. But if they're not provided, they're risk factors. So our goal has to be to assure all five of these key elements of nurturing care are ad addressed. At the same time, we know that responsive caregiving can only be provided if the caregiver herself or himself is supported socially, emotionally, and economically. And that is a central underpinning to support the nurturing care elements that you'll hear about today. I want to just acknowledge that what you'll hear throughout these presentations are the importance of those elements of nurturing care, but also the underpinning of supporting the caregiver as a key element to assure that those protective factors are in place. So let's turn back to the answers uh, to the mentee poll. Um, people want to understand how the program holistically is different by different ages. And even though we talk about early childhood, pregnancy and infancy is very different than children four and five and six years old. To connect with colleagues, to hear from concrete examples, uh, to how to frame the links to primary prevention, 
understand the child holistically um, and give examples and obviously to get new information. So we hope that the speakers are seeing those, um, those expectations of the session and uh, we thank you for sharing those. Remember, you can also put questions in the chat as you go along, as you hear the speakers, and we'll be monitoring the chat throughout. So thank you for answering those of you that were able to answer the poll. And let me turn to our speakers. Um, I want to start by saying again, we'll have three speakers. And our first speaker, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Teresa Betancourt, who is the Salem Professor in Global Practice at Boston College School of Social Work and the Director of the Research Program <laughs> on Children and Adversity um, at Boston College. And Dr. Betancourt, thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Joan, and I want to really thank uh, the organizers for taking up this critical topic in humanitarian response of nurturing care and thinking about children from the very earliest stages. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about in my presentation, which is uh, an example of a home visiting intervention in post-genocide Rwanda to promote nurturing care and prevent violence. So we're integrating uh, these elements of violence prevention into the other dimensions of nurturing care that you heard about from Joan of nutrition, health, safety promotion, and early learning. And I'd also like to talk about the promise of implementation science because what we have globally is an issue of large numbers that we're not reaching. And how can we start to think about scale and sustainment and quality as uh, we address uh, these problems of the children uh, affected by armed conflict globally. Next slide. So I direct a research program on children and adversity. Um, as you heard, we're really interested in understanding these processes of risk and resilience as they relate to child development, child mental health, and to take a strengths-based approach, not just focus on deficits, but to really think about what are the capacities of families and caregivers and young people that we can leverage in our intervention models and to help close this gap between what we know about the science of early uh, uh, childhood development and trauma and what is actually done on the ground in low resource settings, which right now tends to be um, not our highest quality work. And we need to think about how can we develop effective and high quality services and make sure they reach those who need them. And to do this, we do this in partnership. Um, you see here my colleague, Dr. Vincent Cezabera at the University of Rwanda Center for Mental Health, who's been a critical part of this work as well. Next slide. So we've been working um, around the globe in different war affected settings. And this takes all of us to pull uh, together because in our lifetimes, as we know, we're facing the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II. It's now estimated that one in six children live in conflict affected regions. We're talking about 452 million children. And if we extend these numbers to uh, post-conflict settings where I work in West Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, places like Rwanda, the number is much greater. And as you know, UNICEF estimates the number of children living in conflict zones has risen by 74% in the last 20 years. Next slide. So in terms of our current research, we've had an intergenerational study of war running in Sierra Leone, West Africa now for 20 years, where we followed the lives of young men and young women who were involved in armed forces and armed groups now into young adulthood and as they've become parents. And through this, we began to think about um, the intergenerational impact of war and the impact on the next generation in early childhood. Uh, we've done family-based preventative interventions now um, in Sierra Leone, in uh, the United States for resettling refugees, including Somali, uh, Bhutanese, and Afghan refugees. And I'm going to focus in today about uh, the work in Rwanda because not only have we tested an evidence-based model, but we've been testing methods to bring it to greater scale to reach more families. Next slide. This was really the shot heard around the world and um, there are so many people involved in this important Lancet uh, issue in 2007, which reminded us of the grim statistic that over 200 million children under the age of five are not fulfilling their developmental potential. And this means children 36 to 59 months of age 
who are not developmentally on track in domains, at least three of the following domains, literacy, numeracy, physical development, and social emotional development. That statistic was updated in another Lancet edition in 2017 to be over 249 million children. So 43% of children in low and middle income countries at risk of poor development. And when you look at um, concentration, we see many conflict affected parts of the world. And for someone like me who works in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see the high density in Sub-Saharan Africa, many war affected zones. Next slide, please. So what this means for all of us working in this field is not only do we have to think about do interventions work and evaluate their evidence or build on evidence-based interventions, but from the very beginning, we have to think about implementation questions. Who is going to deliver this intervention at greater scale? Is it uh, focused on deployment, on thinking about the context in which it will be delivered? This means issues of workforce, but also acceptability, feasibility, fit to the culture, and it means questions of what will our strategies be to get it out there and maintain the quality and reach as we go. And this means many of us are starting to do work along the line of hybrid design. So we test effectiveness, but we also test implementation questions at the same time about how do we train, how do we supervise, how do we have quality in what we do, and how do we have strategies to reach more children and families, even in conflict-affected settings. And if you're interested in implementation science, there's a journal called Implementation Science. This is one of the core textbooks I'm sharing with you by Ross Brownson and Enola Proctor. But I think it's time the humanitarian field begins to really think about these questions of scale and quality. Next slide, please. So I'd like to now go to Rwanda to our case example. Rwanda is a very exciting country uh, to work in because of its serious commitment to advancing goals related to health and to child development and to education amongst many others. So it's a small country, 13.4 million, uh, but it's making massive strides in addressing infant and child mortality. They've really brought those numbers down dramatically. But they are continue, they have a continuous challenge of high rates of under five stunting, which is a broad indicator of underdevelopment in children. And they're also struggling with the after effects of the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, in which over the course of 100 days, nearly 800,000 people were killed. Uh, they've then also suffered um, complications related to the HIV AIDS epidemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we see, intergenerational violence continues today in Rwanda at high rates. Uh, recent estimates are that 50% of all children have experienced violence in Rwanda. But you have tremendous strength in the country, political stability, a strong government, and strong decentralization. So they're really giving ownership and leadership um, to the districts. And Rwanda has built early childhood development and nurturing care into its economic development and poverty reduction strategy. So that comment that Joan made in the introduction about care for the caregivers also needing financial support is an important part of how they think about vulnerable families and families living in poverty today. Next slide, please. So we started in Rwanda with a National Institutes of Mental Health funded study thinking about another form of adversity, which was HIV and AIDS and parenting in the context of those challenges. And at that time, we developed a family strengthening intervention. It was a home visiting intervention done by local Rwandans and non-specialists. This is a big movement, especially within global. We don't have a high number of highly trained professionals. We are now demonstrating we can train non-specialists to do evidence-based practices if they receive excellent training and excellent supervision. So we piloted that, and then we were asked by the government and the World Bank to think about uh, an early childhood development version of it, and that became what we call Sugeta Mayango, or Strength in the Family. Uh, I'll show you the results of a large cluster randomized trial that was funded by the World Bank, and now in the most recent stage, working with uh, partners such as Grand Challenges Canada, Lego Foundation, ELMA, Echidna Giving, Oak Foundation, USAID, and Wellspring, we've been expanding this evidence-based model uh, with a goal to reach 10,000 children in extreme poverty in post-genocide Rwanda. Next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about our model and uh, what it looks like in terms of promoting nurturing care and reducing violence. So Mayango is a home visiting model 
It's meant to be flexible so we can work with any sort of family, which is really some of the magic of home visiting. We can work with dual headed households, single headed households. It can be grandmother, grandfather, auntie, uncle raising the children. We can work with any family configuration. And we do active coaching in the home, which is in those serve and return interactions between uh, caregivers and their children. At every session, there's 15 minutes of a play-based interaction. And we iterate that depending on the development, the developmental stage of the child. And we coach the parents to take uh, note of when they follow their child's lead of how it leads to new ways for the child um, to develop and learn in the world and the joy they can take in that role. And I think for a lot of families in crisis, sometimes crisis can feel overwhelming. So to feel that you can do something for your young child can be extremely empowering. And so we have standard content on uh, nutrition, on hygiene promotion, on the importance of play and stimulation, all of that coming from the WHO Care for Child Development and UNICEF package. But we've also maintained from our HIV intervention content on conflict resolution, stress management for caregivers, problem solving, breaking down problems into small steps. And because we have a home visitor, they get to know the family. They can look at where are you preparing food? Where are the children sleeping? Are you on the national health insurance, which uh, Rwanda has a national health insurance. And so they can help them navigate formal and informal resources and supports. Uh, we also spend a lot of time because we're focused on violence prevention and thinking about how do we involve males? So we try to show up at times that men are around, that they've finished their work for the day, they've had a meal, and we really encourage in all of our messaging and in our activities that we're involving male and female caregivers. And through doing this, we've been able to involve males in 75% of our modules. And uh, we find that this intervention is complementary to other activities the government has going related to nurturing care, including uh, community sensitization campaigns, uh, the scaled up early childhood development centers in the country and home-based child care initiatives. Next slide, please. So here's the results of our two published trials. If you're interested to learn more, the citations are there. I'm happy to share them if you reach out. Um, this was a cluster randomized trial with 1,049 families. So you can see the evidence behind this intervention. So pre to post intervention, those who were uh, randomly allocated to receive Sugiro Moyango, the home visiting intervention, we saw a significant increase in access to more stimulating materials in the home and increase in playful activities with children between caregivers, uh, increased help seeking for problems like diarrhea uh, and fever, and also safe treatment of drinking water. So all of those elements of nurturing care that Joan talked about. But we also saw at the family level, a decrease in children's exposure to violent discipline, a significant decrease in intimate partner violence, and we saw an impact on mental health and the caregivers. In both male and female caregivers, we saw reductions in anxiety and depression symptoms and increased male engagement and caregiving for the young children. One year later, we came and followed up those same families and we saw on the child development outcomes, improved motor skills, communication skills, problem solving skills, and personal social skills. We also, excitingly, one year later, saw continued reductions, lower levels, of harsh child discipline and families who'd received the home visiting coaching and continued reduction in intimate partner violence, as well as continued higher engagement of males in caregiving for their young children. Next slide, please. So the big question becomes, how do we get this out there in the world? If it works, it's developed for this context that uses non-specialists. When we did the trial, we didn't yet have approval from the government to work with community health workers. That was our first idea. But it became clear over the years of um, conversation with the ministries that there was a workforce in child protection called the Inshuti Zumanyango or the Friends of the Family Workers who could really be our strategy for scale. Because when Rwanda is back into home-based um, environments, they had nominated in every village one male and one female in Shuti Zumanyango. So this became an idea for how we could reach greater scale. The workforce was there, but we needed a strategy for training and supervising the intervention as we rolled it out at greater scale in this new workforce. Next slide. So we call this strategy the Play Collaborative. And one important element is integration into another platform for delivery. So how will we identify the families who should receive the home visiting intervention? Of course, it would be good for everyone, but we have limited resources. 
So we linked the program to Rwanda's flagship social protection or poverty reduction strategy, which is called the Vision Umarenge program. It's focused on reducing extreme poverty, promoting gender equality, increasing attention to so social safety nets. And it's a win-win for us to link to because we want to identify and recruit the most vulnerable families. It brings us into partnership with the government and allows us to find a shared vision together on promoting uh, the well-being of young children in adversity. And it helps us link to referral systems um, for health, nutrition, social services. And this is guided by the Implementation Model Exploration Preparation Implementation Sustainment, or EPIS, um, which is a nice way to map out the ecosystem that you're implementing within. And we've got papers on that if you're interested. Um, very important to understand context because every context is different, especially in humanitarian emergencies. So the active ingredients of our strategy for scaling include a seed team that's Rwandan. They're based in Rwanda. It doesn't require people coming from the United States to do the training. We all agree to a common charter to commit to quality improvement. We are working now in three districts trying to reach 10,000 children. You see that um, model there of cross-site learning. And we use plan, do, study, act cycles as we encounter implementation barriers to study them and overcome them. Uh, so to do this, it's been going on since 2019, um, working with the Rwandan government. We've now trained 6,200 local officials. We've had uh, meetings with over 15,000 government officials in each of these three districts at every level, from the national to the district, to the sector, to the cell. We've trained over 2,500 of these friends of the family workers, and we've reached um, nearly 10,000 children and nearly 20,000 caregivers. Next slide. We also see a cost benefit ratio done by our economists that the return on investment, if you look at what we get in violence reduction and improved child development, uh, which contributes to schooling outcomes, anywhere from 3.8 to $5 for every $1 invested. So just to wrap up, because I know we're short for time. I hope that uh, you can go to the next slide. I hope that in the talk today, I've been able um, to really convince you that in humanitarian emergencies and post-conflict settings, there are an increasing number of evidence-based models to promote nurturing care and reduce violence, but we need to think about the questions of scale and quality uh, and implementation research uh, as we think about the numbers we have to address. This has major implications for how we think about the humanitarian development and peace-building nexus. Uh, because these investments early on can be the foundation for more sustainable future systems. If we do this right in emergencies, we're training workforce, we're building systems that can transition to being there in the post-conflict setting. And there are lots of creative opportunities to integrate. I've shown you a model that integrated within the poverty reduction or social protection system. We can integrate evidence-based nurturing care interventions into programs for nutrition, for health, for education as we think about the humanitarian response. But we need enabling environments. We need those financing structures that are longer term that really build that bridge between emergency response and development and peace building. And we need to think about issues of quality at scale. We need evidence on cost and return on investment. And all of this requires strong and multi-level partnerships to get impact at greater scale. So if you're interested to read more, uh, here's our QR code. And I just thank you for giving me a chance to speak today. Thank you so much, Ter Teresa. I, I know there's a lot of questions and what's really exciting about your work, and we'll come back to you in a Q&A, is uh, the breadth of the implementation data you're collecting. And I think a lot of people listening are, are going to be very interested in that, and we'll come back to that in the Q&A. But I <clears throat> want to move on to Sarah Christine Delane, um, and if we could be up her slides. Uh, Sarah Christine is the executive director of IACT, um, a great organization that's implementing the Little Ripples program, which is their early childhood program, among other things. So, Sarah, over to you. Great. Hello. Thank you, John. Wonderful to be here with you all. And thank you to Teresa for uh, an inspiring presentation and to hear kind of uh, about the impact and scale of your intervention. Uh, my name is Sarah Christine. As Joan mentioned, I'm the executive director of IACT. IACT works in partnership with refugees and conflict-affected people to co-create early childhood education 
and soccer programs that nurture well-being, agency, and joy. We are a small U.S.-based team, um, and we work directly in partnership with refugee and conflict-affected people. So we currently support and employ 245 uh, people across uh, six countries who are leading programs for children in their communities. And so today, um, slide, today I'll be presenting on IAC's early childhood education program, Little Ripples. Litter Ripples um, is an example of an early learning program uh, within the Nurturing Care Framework. It is a play-based, trauma-informed, and community-led early childhood education program that supports the social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development of children ages three to five. And so today I'll be giving an overview of uh, the program within the um, across 14 refugee camps in Eastern Chad. Um, I'll share a little bit about how the program was co-created with members of the refugee community, how it is led by the community, um, by women who step into the roles of teacher, education director, and coordinator, um, and also share some elements um, of the program within the nurturing care framework and some outcomes of the program. Um, so here, uh, Little Ripples was initially co-created uh, in one refugee camp with Darfuri refugees um, over 2011 and 2012. Um, these are refugees who are living across 14 refugee camps in Eastern Chad. They've been there since 2003, 2004 um, as a result of the genocide in Darfur. Um, their camps are currently hosting more than 370,000 refugees. But as you might have seen in the news recently, there is war again in Sudan. Um, and as a result, these camps have already received um, more than 125,000 people, um, and there are more arriving as we speak. So just a little bit of context there. But really, the program uh, was created because of what you're seeing in this photo. Um, years and years ago, uh, when walking the camps with our refugee friends and colleagues, um, this is what we observed and experienced a preschool to be, how, how we cared for uh, young children in these camps. Um, so what was not pictured here actually is that within this type of space, about 100 to 150 children uh, would be packed sitting shoulder to shoulder, um, you know, staring up at, at the front of the space, um, hosted by one or two women who uh, had received really little support or training in how to care and provide um, uh, services for these children. And so you know, this was what at the time was deemed acceptable uh, for uh, early childhood learning um, across the refugee camps in Eastern Chad, um, not, you know, for children at their most critical stage of human development and for children who had and for their families who had experienced horrific violence and displacement. So there continues to be um, a gap in early education within the country of Chad and early education within the refugee camps are not integrated within the country. So they are operating um, in silo kind of in, with support from the humanitarian system. Um, so for us, it was walking the camp, it was witnessing this, it was listening uh, to families, to caregivers, to parents, um, understanding their experience, their daily experience, what they hoped for for their young children, um, hearing all of that and taking all that information and informing what an early, what a quality early education program might look like um, in their community. Next slide. So a little bit about our approach. Um, again, for us, it was first the listening. So we um, really tried to understand and work with the members of the community, with parents, with traditional leaders, with other actors in within the education in the community to understand really what the lived experience was, the values, expectations around um, early childhood education and young children. Um, through that process over years, we naturally built relationships. Um, we naturally began to identify champions within the community who were interested in um, providing quality care uh, in their community. And so what we do is we embark on really kind of an ongoing process of co-creation. Um, you know, after listening, building relationships, identifying people in the community who are interested in, in, in leading in early education, we begin a co-creation process. So what we do, I act, is that we provide technical support, resources, funding, and then we work with the community for them to essentially determine um, with these resources, what early education and care can look like for children in their community. So we, we provide teacher training, um, provide an evidence-based framework around early education. But again, it's really with members of the community 
over many months, over years, that we really determine what um, what a quality early education program can look like to really meet the needs of the families and actually meet them kind of addressing um, the, the issues and barriers that they're facing every day. Um, over time, we the community then takes complete ownership of the program. So we've provided teacher training, we've provided resources, we provide ongoing funding, but really it's it's the women who step into the roles of teacher, education director, coordinator, who take the program and lead it day to day. Um, and they're the ones determining where the program takes place. How are they involving um, families? How are children are being enrolled? Um, how the program comes to life um, every day in the community. And then we as an organization provide just ongoing technical support. We see ourselves as partners um, in the process and we see ourselves as supporting their leadership and their capacity development in, in bringing and ensuring quality early childhood education. A few, um, just to give a few examples of what that might look like. So some decisions that were taken by the community as a result of our that co-creation process was one shifting um, to home-based uh, early education. So uh, typically they are, these centers are either aligned with a primary school in the camp or they're so oftentimes like the picture I showed earlier uh, next to a very busy road in the camp where there might be an open space. Um, the idea was, can we bring uh, this program to the home spaces to really meet, again, the kind of the needs of families, reduce distance to early learning, improve safety of children of accessing early learning, um, making, uh, bringing it to the community so that caregivers and families can actually hear and see their children um, learning. And, and also it was a more cost-effective solution. So instead of building schools or are, are building more structures um, on, on with primary schools, the idea was, can we uh, can it be more cost-effective to actually build some, some structures within the home space and create an even more kind of emotionally, physically safe environment for young children? So we did that. We brought the, the program to the home spaces of refugees across the camps. Another um, aspect of the program that was determined by the community was providing a daily nutrition, a new daily nutritious meal at the program. Within the refugee camps in Eastern Chile, still today struggle to provide their children one to two meals a day. Um, and if they are able to provide up to two meals a day, uh, the diversity of nutrition in those meals um, is lacking. And so, you know, seeing that children cannot learn and develop if they are hungry, if they are malnourished, um, you know, Caregivers, parents, families really advocated that if children could come to the program and receive a nutritious meal, that would make all the difference. And so um, together with our team, we listened and the program now hires two women from the community for each home base center to source local food, search a diversity of food every week and provide a daily nutritious meal to those children. So those are just some of the examples of some of the decisions that were made um, with the community in this context. Slide. And then a little bit about our curriculum framework. So again, as I mentioned, IACT is a technical kind of uh, advisor and supporter in this process. We, uh, along with experts in early childhood development, develop an evidence-based framework of the best practices in early childhood learning um, and also adapting that to children who have and continue to experience trauma. So it's, it's really rooted in play-based learning and rooted in the rights of child and trauma-informed care. Um, so every, you know, Little Ripples Center, you will see, uh, you will not see children sitting down all day long, uh, listening and repeating. You will see children moving and learning and engaging. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the rights of child. So we mentioned, you know, safety, bringing, bringing the program to the homes, um, improving access, nutrition, bringing, providing a daily meal, um, creating a really strong sense of belonging and then focus on child development and mindfulness. So child development is happening um, if children are playing and they're learning, they're engaging. And then the mindfulness component, um, the program actually starts every day with some mindfulness. So just that's either, you know, breathing, uh, mindful walking, um, uh, mindful listening to music, um, just a way to bring the children into the space and also help with self-regulation. Um, and so that's the way that the program starts every day. Um, there, are more, there are more aspects to our curriculum. There's a lot of um, uh, modules around positive behavior management and, and how trauma-informed care looks like in an early learning setting. Um, and so these elements are actually 
learned with the teachers taught um, during our literables three-part teacher training series. And then the curriculum, the, this framework is actually brought to life by the teachers. They then infuse this framework with their um, culture, tradition, game stories, experiences, their own stories. So they're the ones who are actually bringing this to life themselves and infusing this and, and really completing the curriculum. Um, this is a framework in that it can be adapted and used alongside any national early education curriculum. Um, so we provide, you know, the curriculum can provide a lot of guidance day to day, but really it is intended to be a framework and kind of a pedagogy um, to inform how uh, teaching and how learning can happen in the classroom. Um, and then lastly, I'll add that uh, it is intentionally also designed to be simple. So in Eastern Chad, for example, we are working um, and bringing women into the early education space who have a, um, varying levels of education. A lot of our teachers have a primary school level of education. Um, that, you know, it's important to us that we create opportunities for women to step into these types of roles and to professionalize the roles of early education and early childhood providers. But we intentionally designed the framework, the training um, to be inclusive of people with a variety and even with, with very limited experience in early learning and development. Slide. And just want to share a few images with you all um, just to bring it to life here. This is an image um, of one of our, our preschool centers in a home. Um, just an image of the kids. This is what, what we call outdoor play um, in the session. Slide. Um, this is an image of a um, in a home base center. So as you can see, it's a quite large um, home compound. Um, the way that the homes are structured in, across the refugee camps in Eastern Chad is that families share a compound and there's quite a bit of space. And so we work with traditional leaders. We work with the block leaders of the camp and families to identify homes throughout a block that have adequate space um, to then provide and create a structure where there's a bit of a platform and a bit of a shade um, for the for kind of the safety of the children, especially around um, the, the heat of the day and when there is rain. Um, but you can see it's a really clean space, really safe. It's, it's completely fenced in. Um, and so, and, and the families themselves are actually responsible for maintaining a really clean and safe space uh, for the program. Slide. And then just one more, this is just kind of a, a zoom in view um, of, of what it looks like at one of, in one of the spaces um, and some kind of circle time engagement here. Slide. Thank you so much, Sarah. And then just a brief overview of REACH, um, 175 teachers, 40 centers across eight camps, 1800 children, so two to 45 teacher ratio, slide. And just to say that, you know, over the years, we've measured baseline follow-up evaluations of the children in the program. We've seen outcomes in social emotional learning, cognitive development. Um, the, the families and, and community are really proud of the program. Uh, primary school teachers anecdotally are reporting that children coming out of the, the preschool program are emotionally and academically kind of more grounded in the classroom. And then for the, the women themselves, um, the 172 women that we employ in this program, across the camps. For them, it's been a transformational experience. Um, they are also the ones who are now scaling the program. So I just want to end with that to say that, that now it is our experienced literables team who are traveling either within their camp or to other camps in Eastern Chad to they themselves are scaling the program and they are the ones embarking on this kind of co-creation process with, uh, with communities in other camps. Well, Sarah, it's transformational just listening to you. Um, and I know we could spend a whole we could spend a whole hour on each one of them and have a number of questions. I, it's very inspirational. We know you're working in one of the most difficult situations, particularly right now as we read what's going on. So just a thank you both Teresa and to Sarah. I'm going to move us on to Mania Menar, um, and I want to make sure that speakers watch their time so we don't run out. We have two more speakers after Minar, and I want to allow for some questions. So let me uh, turn to Minar Shukri, who is the uh, IRC Regional Technical Lead for Alan Simpson, and very excited that we're getting results 
out of that amazing um, work that's going on in the region. So over to you, Minar. And again, let's watch our time so we can allow for some questions. Minar, up to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for your time. I will be presenting uh, um, an early childhood development case in the Middle East. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in my presentation, I would like to introduce you to Salma, 20 years old, a mother of two children, Rami, six years, and Sana, a year and a half. Due to the conflict in Syria, they had to leave their hometown and settle in a new place inside, inside Syria. Next slide, please. Okay. They, are, they arrived to the new place called Idlib, where Salma started earning her living by sewing clothes. Our first interaction with Salma was when IRC, Ahlan Simsim team, invited her to participate in a group discussion as part of the human-centered design approach, approach used for a parenting program, which is now named and called Ahlan Simsim Families. Next slide, please. Uh, IRC Ahlan Simpson team gathered feedback from Salma and other caregivers across the region to design a program relevant to their needs. Based on the information we collected and the feedback they provided us, Ahlan Simpson Families program was piloted in different places and we gathered another round of feedback. We enhanced the content uh, um, during 2021 before the final finalization and the dissemination uh, for all countries. The human-centered uh, design approach steps are uh, assess the needs of caregivers, design the intervention based on the needs, develop and contextualize content, test the intervention with sample of clients, collect feedback from all stakeholders, including caregivers and facilitators, enhanced based on the feedback, disseminate to use the intervention at scale. Next, please. In 2022, Selma approached the Early Childhood Development Center as she was struggling to manage her son Rami's behavior. Selma was introduced to Ahlan Simpson families and participated in 12 in-person group sessions over six weeks. Each session lasted for 90 minutes. Selma received WhatsApp messages following each session, including videos, storybooks, posters, and other content to use with Rami or to deepen her knowledge about uh, one of the concepts she was introduced to. Next slide, please. Uh, those are the topics uh, we address in the 12 sessions. Uh, those topics are aligned with the nurturing care framework uh, component, and there is a big focus on prevention. We have integrated protection concepts in several sessions, such as child uh, behavior, the well-being of the caregiver and the child, body privacy. Uh, the body privacy session is about sexual development, and, it, it, yeah, and to our surprise, this topic was demanded by the caregivers. We also have sessions about child protection and other messages that ensure child safety and protection. Next slide, please. So what makes uh, Ahlan Simpson family special? It's flexible, responsive, responsive activities to meet diverse health protection and education needs. Uh, contextualization, localization, adaptability of content to be implemented within camp, urban, less stable settings. Face-to-face -face and remote implementation modalities, we have uh, two different uh, modalities to implement. Increasing focus on caregiver well-being. Uh, inclusive intervention, ensuring equal opportunities for men, women, who are caregivers of boys and girls, including those with disabilities. In fact, this model, uh, we have adapted from it to uh, messages, and it was integrated into the Ministry of Health uh, in Jordan. We have integrated uh, in uh, school uh, PTA sessions, so it's really adaptable and contextualized for the region. 
Next, please. Allow me now to uh, present to you the feedback from two of our clients. Uh, a mother uh, in Iraq said, I used to think that, uh, the uh, that the child at this stage is growing physically and there is nothing that affects his psychological conditions. But now I have, to, I have come to understand the needs of my child. Another feedback, uh, mom, you no longer scream at me as much as you did before. A caregiver in Jordan quoting her uh, daughter. Next, please. We have done cost analysis of the Ahlan Simpson uh, program, uh, the cost efficiency analysis in person program, the cost range between 25 to $75 per, give, per caregiver remotely as low as $11 uh, per caregiver, cost driver, uh, staff and personnel, uh, cost for staff with partners was lower than cost for staff uh, of IRC. Supplies and materials were low cost, very low cost, in fact. In implementation context matters, uh, for, for example, Northeast Syria context made cost a bit higher to start up but then higher reach, and as you scale, the costs were lower. In Lebanon, costs were a, lo a lot higher uh, per caregiver because we were implementing at, uh, at much lower uh, scale. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you all for listening, and I hope I have uh, stick to the time. Yes, Mara, thank you so much. You have... Uh, really given us a lot of information in a short amount of time. We were going to go to Q&A, but I'm going to ask uh, people's indulgence and introduce the other speakers. But let me key up three questions, um, one for each of you to be thinking about, and maybe you can even answer in the chat um, and then answer if we have time at the end. Teresa, there's a lot of interest in your model. I, I was wondering if you could... Um, answer what's the advantage of working with the social protection system i think you've emphasized that and i think that's a question that people have so if you could even answer that in the chat it would be great um sarah you're working in one of the most challenging uh settings what's the lesson you've learned about why little ripples has been successful and then minar a lot of people are interested in the curriculum and the materials you have um, it's been really exciting to watch this unfold. What are the implications of this for other humanitarian settings? What can we use from all of the wealth of materials that have been developed and bring on the ground to other people? And I think that's probably a question for all of us. So there's so much richness here. It's hard not to stop and have you answer those, but I wanted to tee up those questions before we move to make sure we get time to go to the final two speakers. First, I wanna introduce Gabriella Brent, who's the head of program programming for Aman Amna. Uh, Gabriella, turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, and while we're getting the slides up, it's so fantastic really to hear it actually as people are presenting about the alignment across our programs and really thinking about how holistic the programs are, really thinking about co-creating and connecting with um, the communities that we work with to develop the programming and to develop very localized responses, uh, supporting locals who are experts in their contacts and um, displaced and refugee communities to be kind of leaders and designers of services. So that's all really at the heart of Amna's work. So um, as Joan said, I'm, I'm Amna's head of programs uh, and my background is as a psychotherapist and counsellor that's really focused on systemic approaches. So really taking therapeutic practice out of the therapy room and how do you embed it in holistic systems of care. And Amna's, uh, next slide please, um, Amna's uh, approach, we do a number of different things, but uh, all of our work is centered around community, collective healing, psychosocial practice. So they are spaces where we work with uh, local communities, refugee communities, 
to nurture joy and belonging um, through trauma and identity informed practices that support people who have coped with uh, toxic, a huge amount of stress that may have led to stress buildup in their bodies, toxic stress, who may be carrying trauma in their bodies to start to regain a sense of safety um, with a sense of dignity and in community from which they can draw a sense of solidarity. Next slide, please. So we started in 2016 and for the first three years of operation where we started in Greece uh, when the refugee crisis started and there were many, many thousands of people uh, coming, particularly from uh, Middle Eastern countries due to uh, war and conflict, but also from many, many other countries as well. Um, we started a direct delivery program that really was testing whether if you set up a community healing space in an externally unsafe environment like a camp um, that created a safe space inside it and you had facilitators that were from the communities affected and you had facilitators speaking the languages of those communities and embedded embedding um, creative healing practices does this a attract people to come is it something that people feel they need and does it have an impact and uh, what we have found is that it really does and that's I'm going to take you through that. So our goal as AMNA is um, to improve access to quality, um, meaningful community healing spaces that wherever possible are led by the communities themselves. Um, we really want the long-term impact to be where people who have become refugees um, don't live a future that is completely conditioned by uh, becoming a refugee. Um, and so we want people to have healing practices that support them in the short term, but also try to mitigate the long-term impacts of trauma. And really our mission is to work to build the community uh, collective healing capacity and that we do that through partnering with local organizations um, that uh, we work with hubs. So we train a collection of organizations together at the same time in a region or in a country. They then become a community of practice that, has, that, that learn and share practice together. And then we join up our different communities of practice in different parts of the world into a wider healing network where we're all sharing practice and uh, developing research and learning lessons together that then collectively we can advocate for um, this mission and vision. Next slide, please. So we run a number of programs, but our um, our kind of seminal and first program that when we moved from taking all of our learning from running a direct delivery services ourselves into codifying that into a training and capacity strengthening program that has very similar components to um, what Sara Christine described of the IACT model um, is our Baitna program. And Baitna means our home in Arabic. And it's an early childhood program that works with the child and the caregivers together. It's a whole family approach. And it's really recognizing the caregiver as the most important protect or the caregivers, whoever they are, as the most protective factor for the children. And it's recognizing the impact of displacement, of stress, of a traumatic experience that the caregiver may have experienced that may impact, not necessarily, um, their caregiving that so it's not our job to teach people how to parent but our job is to recognize that the stress that may be put on the caregiver may be impacting on their capacity to be there uh, for their child and to be attuned in the way their child may need whether that's them becoming really um, overly attached because they've spent so much time together or maybe not having the um, emotional bandwidth to really meet the child uh, with their needs because of the range of things they're coping with themselves practically and emotionally. Next slide, please. So um, like Sarah Christine spoke, our, our methodology is that as AMNA, we've collected um, uh, learning and all of our learning has been influenced by um, the communities that we've worked with. So all of our program is co-created with communities that we work with. Um, our organization as well is a refugee-led organization. Zalasht, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, um, was herself a refugee from Afghanistan. And in our um, in our board, as our CEO, and in our team, we've got people with lived experience um, who are part of designing and delivering our programs. So our methodology is really based around healing pay practices that build upon um, evidence-based practices, but also importantly, the evidence-based practices are really evidencing traditions that have existed since the beginning of time about how communities convene, 
how they heal together, how they make meaning together and make sense of different experiences to support um, a kind of collective sense of uh, resilience and, and, and sense of future. So we train our partners in understanding uh, trauma and identity informed practices, looking at things from a biological or sociocultural lens. And then we train people in different collective healing uh, practices. So for example, the use of movement and dance and rhythm as a way of helping people to regain a sense of safety, the use of storytelling, arts and creative activities, and then really building in different practices that support, you know, grounding, emotional regulation, um, different mindfulness-based practices. And everything is done um, in a community space um, that really is trying to bring in for caregivers and children that sense of joy and that sense of belonging because one of the casualties of an overwhelming amount of stress and loss and grief can be that we really lose our connection to experiencing pleasure to experiencing joy and laughter and so we really that's something that we're bringing back in in the spaces um, that we work next slide please so just to give you a little sense of what a baitness session looks like um we train our partners so there's as uh, as a number of colleagues have spoken to there's a lot of flexibility so we don't say to our partners you must do it like this exactly we train them in different practices and the theory and methodologies that help them to understand how can you safely as a non-therapeutic specialist use these practices to promote emotional regulation um, and, the, and the way that we do this is training them also to understand the importance of structure and ritual to create that sense of safety and predictability so every session we should have the same um, format, even if the content and design of the session is different from session to session. So every session will have a, a, a kind of starting and ending ritual, which is where every individual who comes into that space is greeted in a way that they choose and supports their agency. That's then free space. So all of our um, sessions have a combination of structured and unstructured activities. And in the free play space, there's really support for children and caregivers to follow what is within them. So there's all the different materials around the room and they get to initiate um, the play that they would like, whether individually or in groups. And we train facilitators to really follow, um, follow the child, follow the caregiver. And that's really about nurturing curiosity um, and play. We then always have circle time, and this is really a space for bearing witness. It's for coming together. It's for recognizing every individual in that group. And we incorporate different um, emotional, social emotional activities that invite group members, that caregivers and children to check in. And that's really being welcome to share how they are as they are through different games and, and play-based activities where they don't have to put on a brave face. They don't have to feel good. And it's really important when you're working with refugee displaced communities that there is a space where they're allowed to come just as they are, because in all these other services, people have to put on a brave face, have to be polite when inside they're feeling all sorts of different feelings. And then there's a different um, collective healing, creative play set of activities that combine structured and unstructured activities. It might be music and storytelling and the facilitators are incredibly creative about linking perhaps a story to then an activity to then some sort of sensorial activity. And then all sessions are ended with relaxation activities that are um, really supporting participants to leave emotionally regulated. And overall, next slide, please. What we're really looking at is supporting caregivers and children to have an experience inside the Baitner sessions, but also that they can take with them. And when we've um, got feedback from caregivers and children after in the sessions, but also after they've left, they've told us that as they've continued on their journeys into other countries, they've sung songs, they've stole stories, they've done activities together that they've taken from the Baitner session and into their future environments. Just for time, I'm not going to talk through these examples, but you can see some free play and, um, you know, in the first one, you can see actually somebody playing um, kind of nurse and child. And this is actually a child exploring uh, for herself, her mother's very traumatic birth experience that she'd been around. Um, you can see children sort of coming together and playing in a collective activity in the middle one. And in the last one, there's a, we do lots of different kind of sensorial play and painting activities, um, sometimes on faces, sometimes on plexiglass, and you can see a child there doing it herself. Next slide, please. Um, so we're just going to play you a very short one minute video now that gives you a sense of um, the Baitner in practice. 
And then I'm just going to conclude with some evaluation findings from uh, University of Virginia uh, Humanitarian Collaborative who evaluated our program. We support the young refugee children that have been through many difficult and stressful experiences. Our job is to let them feel safe and secure. Through free play, art and movement, uh, children uh, develop coping skills that help them overcome the traumatic events. Many children enter the room anxious and they learn how to calm down and uh, relax and to be present. try to focus on the whole family and we involve them in our sessions and uh, empower them by providing tools to deal with the children and support their growth. In our group, lots of children make new friends, they feel welcomed and uh, they learn social skills, solving problems. The most important thing for me is these children to be present and confident and continue their life. Thank you for showing that. Um, so that was just to give you a little sense of what a session looks like inside the room. Um, and then just very briefly, I'm going to finish with um, some evaluation findings. So uh, we were fortunate to have um, UVA's, next slide please, um, the University of Virginia um, Humanitarian Collaborative evaluate um, the Baitner program. And these are some of their key findings. Next slide please. So they really uh, found that refugee leadership, values-based practice, which is, I don't have time to talk more to today, culturally sensitive identity informed practice, so not us imposing uh, what we think um, and kind of songs from uh, you know, a certain part of the world, but really community-led uh, interventions uh, into practice. Uh, trauma-sensitive practice, which is really about not assuming that people are traumatized because they've become displaced, but training practitioners in how to work with people who may be carrying uh, an overwhelming amount of stress and trauma in their body, and really about being a learning organization. So very iterative practice where um, as we got feedback from the communities work with and the practitioners work with that we incorporated that as we went along. Next slide, please. And these are some of the findings uh, are at the child-based level. Um, so they found that there was improved well-being for children, and this was kind of reported from caregivers about noticing their children's sleep improving and being generally calmer and happier, um, improved interactions with other children, so that you know lots of symptoms in terms of uh, withdrawal or kind of uh, difficulty sharing with things that caregivers really noticed um, a difference with and also just a desire to go out and interact. Um, so kind of some of that um, agrophobia being met and then improved self-regulation, children and caregivers really um, developing um, an ability to talk more about their emotions and having less intense responses to situations um, and, and approaching their caregivers more with their needs. Next slide, please. Uh, next, I'll skip this. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I just leave this quote on the screen, but something that they really found about the Baitner program is that by focusing on the family as a whole system, but also really incorporating refugee facilitators as the ones who led the service, um, it took a more systemic approach and it was really uh, modeling a way in which local communities, if you can support them and you combine local host communities with refugee communities and you co-create something together, um, really does provide an option, a, a kind of a model of how you can work um, to support uh, development of interventions that will last sort of beyond um, 
often beyond crisis going. And in, the, in our emergency responses, this has been so important. AMNA takes a very localized approach. We don't go and set up an in-country office. We find local partners who we support to deliver these interventions and who will continue to deliver beyond our training and funding capacity strengthening to them. Um, next slide, please. In fact, I will end there. So this is just some pictures uh, to see some of uh, AMNA's services. We also work with youth and adults, but I've spoken today about our early childhood program. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Gabriela. That was very, um, I really want to thank everybody on your team for underscoring the importance of supporting the psychosocial uh, context of the family, of localizing your response. So many aspects of this. Many people are asking for your slides. Um, we can say something about what will be available after, but. Um, Again, send our regards to Zarlash and thank you for your work. Um, we're going to move to our last speaker, and then if we have time, I'll do a few questions. But it is really my honor to have our concluding speaker be Dr. Era Mariam, who is the executive director of BRAC Institute uh, of Educational, Educational Development. And I should also add, is the co-chair with me of the Forum on Young Children in Emergencies and we hope you're all following that, getting our updates. And um, with that, it is really my honor to turn it over to you, Aaron. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Joan. Thank you so much. And you know, I know we've heard from so many parts of the world. So uh, now it's time for the you know for us to talk about the Rohingya from Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so what I will speak to you about is the engaging communities to design ECD interventions, how we have really incorporated the nurture and care framework into ECD and how children and families actually have co-created this with us. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So this is actually the uh, Cox's Bazar, the Rohingya refugee camp. It is the largest refugee camp in the world. And, you know, like you see, it is congested. Uh, and, you know, here, actually, this has been uh, the program that we do. Uh, you know, we were there from 2017, ever since the Rohingya arrived in Bangladesh from Myanmar. And, uh, you know, when they arrived, we had actually about 700,000 Rohingya refugees coming from Myanmar. And already in Bangladesh, there were about 300,000. So now it is close to a little more than a million uh, Rohingya refugees who are in Cox's Bazar. But you know, in Cox, in this uh, area, this, uh, the one that you see here, it's very interesting because you know we were able to scale it. We were absolutely able to scale uh, ECD interventions, the, the what we call the humanitarian play labs. Uh, you know, here, I mean, we uh, we reached about 93,000 children who were aged between zero to six and over 90,000 caregivers. So it is a program that was scaled. And, you know, we started from 2017 when the parents, when the caregivers came and, you know, we saw them coming with actually nothing in their hands, only something which was really dear to them, like the cooking utensil, like the, you know, solar panel. And when they came, they said, you know, we have lost everything, but, you know, we have something in our life and that is our children. So we found the community so invested to do something for their children. And here it was possible to scale also because, you know, the child protection sector, it is the child protection sector that hosts the, that provides the uh, platform for the largest ECD program in the camp, which is being uh, run by us. And I have to thank also the government of Bangladesh because it is the government of Bangladesh that has been approving all the interventions that we have been doing. Uh, so, you know, here I also want to say that all the Rohingya, you know, the caregivers and children, they come under also all the other sectors like health and nutrition and, you know, water and sanitation. And most recently also uh, caregivers come under livelihood. Uh, so this is a very, very thriving uh, refugee camp. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what you saw now, you know, this is what a typical Rohingya household looks like. Now, uh, you know, this will have some space like we see in, uh, you know, there's like a veranda and then 
Um, typically, it will have either one room or two rooms where the children live with the families. Now, there are some, you know, wines and vegetable growing now that we see, but this wasn't there before. So over the years, we find that it's become much more green. And, uh, you know, there's also all the toilet facilities are outside of the house. But this is what a typical Rohingya child would be, you know, who is there. Would This is the this would be his or her home. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, what is our ethos? The ethos is that, you know, uh, it is the community who knows. It is the it is the children and the families who know. I mean, we really, really encourage and you know we absolutely endorse the cultural identity we believe that you know it is the cultural identity that really needs to be uh, you know looked into and that is where the co creation comes from so we absolutely believe in contextualization we believe that cultural identity is extremely important as well as community values so those that is the ethos that we work with that you know it is about really looking into discovering that culture and working with the children and the families about the culture that ultimately gives shape to that nurturing care practice and the ECD. So next slide, please. Yeah, so we work with caregivers like this. So the caregivers, I mean, what we found is when we work with caregivers, what we found is, you know, we work with mothers and my mothers would say that, yes, we have so many lullabies. We sing spiritual songs to, to our infants uh, and toddlers. And, you know, when we work with fathers, the fathers would also say that, you know, they, you know, they, what is it, what is the kind of engagement that they do with the children? What are the kind of plays that they do with the children? I mean, you know, this father, what he has done is he's made a car with a cooking oil container. And so, you know, we absolutely take a two generational approach that we work with the caregivers and we work with the children. When we try to understand what is meaningful, what is important for the Rohingya mothers, for the Rohingya fathers, and we take, we, we try to work uh, on those concepts. So next slide, please. Yeah, so in this case, I mean, you know, the mother is there with the child and then there's a frontliner, mind you, we have about 900 frontliners, all from the refugee community. And it is frontliners like this who engage with the mothers and fathers and who really consult with the mothers and fathers and who engage with them. And that is where so many sessions happen. So, you know, it is mothers groups. We have about 1400 mothers groups that we, uh, you know, that we uh, implement. You know, for the fathers groups, we have about 500 fathers groups that we implement. And for the children who are age two to six, we have about, you know, almost uh, we have 304. But, you know, in the mothers groups like this, what we do is we speak, speak to the mothers about what is important for her. What does she value? What is important for her well-being and mental health? And of course, we speak about the child's mental health and social emotional development and stimulation. But, you know, through these discoveries, you know, we absolutely, we organize sessions and all our sessions that we do, whether it is in a, uh, you know, it is in the mother's groups with infants or whether it is in the father's group or whether it is for the two to six children, all the content comes from the refugee community themselves. So next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, when we design spaces, the space is so important for the children and, you know, for the mothers and fathers. So when we design spaces, it is children like this. They design the space and, you know, they do Rohingya art. And, you know, Rohingya are a community, they're extremely rich in their art and culture. And, you know, uh, children would be coming in and they would do the art. Next slide, please. And so, you know, it is going to be spaces like this, which is made of bamboo, but where we have so much art and the art is drawn by, you know, the children, you know, by the mothers, by the aunts, by the fathers, and, you know, they do flowers. So many times we find Rohingya, uh, they do flowers, they make paper flowers and they would decorate these spaces. And so design of spaces is extremely important. And this is the space where the children who are two to six, they would come, they come in two cohorts, whether they are two to four or four to six. This is the space where the mothers, you know, they would come with their infants. And, you know, for the father's group, sometimes we find it's a different space. But, you know, for these, for the, for the children and for the mothers, these are the spaces which are beautifully decorated by them. Next, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so, you know, when we did the discovery about content and, you know, when we did the discovery, we asked the children, you know, what do you want to tell us? What do you want to show us? And every time they would do the rhymes, they call it kabya. So the kabya, we collected about 65 rhymes from the children and the communities. And, you know, they, the children do the kabya in groups in, and they do it in rhythm. And, uh, you know, then when they do it, you know, they, they absolutely love doing that. And, you know, when they do it, they, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, one child would come in front and the others would do the kabya, but the kabya is an integral part of the Rohingya culture. And whether the child is two or whether the child is six, they will all do kabya. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so look at this. I mean, these are play, these are physical play, but you know, with the Rohingya physical, physical play, there's so much of movement and you know, there's so much of coordination and balance. And you know, this is all we collected again from the Rohingya children and the families, you know, there were caregivers who would say that, yes, these are the, these are the physical play that we absolutely love, the children. And you know, the facilitators, you know, Rohingya women clad in absolute black burqa, they would be doing this along with the children, you know, sometimes pregnant, but they would be doing this. Why? Because it is their culture. That is why. And, you know, please see that, you know, the child, one child has a, a face painted. This is also part of Rohingya culture. So, you know, the Rohingya have beautiful physical play. We, we have collected about 35 and these are absolute, the children, absolutely children and the adult facilitators, they just love it. Uh, so um, next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, when we collect, when we do the discoveries, we also find out what, what is so truly meaningful for the Rohingya and sometimes so simple, like a rope. And so these are the ones that we collect. And so the play uh, that we collected from the Rohingya and this play is, you know, this is, of course, so stimulating for the children, but also this is so healing for the children and the and for the for the community and you know there was one day i was there in the in the in in this space and you know the children they were there they were doing their kabbia and they were doing their play and what did we find we found that you know there were people there were you know there were rohingya parents there were rohingya grandparents they came and they surrounded they absolutely surrounded that space. And, you know, we looked at them and we said, what, what is it? And they said that, you know, our children are happy. We have lost everything, but our children here are happy. And so, uh, you know, it was, it brought joy to the community looking that the children were so engaging. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, like I said, we have frontliners who are trained to engage, they are trained, uh, you know, in uh, child protection, case management, all the frontliners are trained in psychosocial support. And so whether the frontliners, I already said that all 900 frontliners are from the refugee community. We don't have any frontliner from, you know, host community, all are from refugee community. Why? Because it is so important for the Rohingya children to be able to see that there that the women the adult women there are you know they are the ones who are leading the sessions they are role models for the others and so you know it's the rohingya women who conduct the session for the children <coughs> who conduct the session with the mothers and we have rohingya men with the fathers but you know they are all trained they provide uh you know engaging like they facilitate the sessions they also provide all the mental health support and if there are any issues then you know they're the ones who will connect with the back end support so each of the frontliners they are connected in a pathway either on case management or in terms of mental health support and i forgot to say something that is when the children came these the ones, the sessions that we do, the spaces that we create with the community. This is for all the children. And when the children came, we found there were few children who had who didn't have their parents with them and they were unaccompanied and separated or separated. And so these spaces that we create is for all children, whether they are with the families or whether they are not with the families. For the children who didn't have their families, we went and we identified foster care. So, you know, these spaces have been created for all the children. So next slide, please. Yeah, so what have I told you? I mean, what have I been saying? I've talked about really what is the environment and how can we make this environment safe? What to the Rohingya is a safe environment? 
what to the Rohingya is a stimulating learning environment, what to the Rohingya is a loving environment, all of this has to be discovered only in collaboration and in collaboration with the Rohingya themselves. So what we do, what we think is definitely this is about an approach that takes the view that all everything, all the content, all the concepts lies with the Rohingya themselves. We absolutely dismiss the deficit model. We absolutely dismiss the top-down imposing model. We believe that it is only through absolute community engagement by engaging with children and caregivers and communities that we will find what is truly there. So next slide, please. And we're almost out of time. So yeah, so this is the space that we create, uh, the Humitan Play Lab. And the next slide, please. Yeah, so why have we done this? Because, you know, this through this, what has happened is this, uh, you know, the approach is respectful, it is empowering, and it builds ownership. And we have been able to scale from 6,000 children to 93,000 children and to so many caregivers. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Um, and I think you have some questions already, but I, I want to underscore how important the message that you just heard about co-creation and you've heard throughout every presentation is, and you know, if we have to conclude with that, with the importance of underscoring the support for the caregiver. Um, Teresa Betancourt put some answers in the chat. Uh, Aram, you have a question about the involvement of the parent. We ran out of time for the video, but we're going to do a link to the video. We do have some questions. Um, a lot of people want the presentation, Maria or Stacy. I don't know if you can make some concluding remarks, but I just want to say to everyone, we have to recommit ourselves to assure that there's financing to underscore these local initiatives and the research that we need to go along with it take the cost benefit analysis and put them to work advocating for more financing for young children in emergencies. Um, that is the way that we can protect their families and, uh, and move forward. And as I think it was Omna that said, continue our work, continue our work. That's the goal. So let me turn it over to you, Stacy. Sorry, we didn't have more time, <clears throat> excuse me, for questions, but I want to thank everyone for these amazing presentations. We have so much to learn.